Head and neck cancers can present a wide variety of symptoms. At UChicago Medicine, our team works to provide the best outcomes for patients while preserving as much speech and swallowing function as possible. UChicago Medicine otolaryngologist Dr. Nishan Agrawal and oncologist Dr. Ari Rosenberg will share what you need to know about head and neck cancers, from early detections and symptoms to treatment options and clinical trials. Our experts will tell you about the latest in care and they'll take your questions live. That's coming up right now on At The Forefront Live. And we want to remind our viewers that today's program is not meant to take the place of an actual visit with your physician. We also want to remind our viewers that you can type in questions for our experts. Do that in the comments section. We'll get to uh, as many of those as possible over the next half hour. First of all, let's just start with having each of you introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about what you do here at UChicago Medicine. Dr. Agrawal, we're going to start with you since you're right here at the desk. Thanks, Tim. My name is uh, Nishant Agrawal. I'm a head and neck surgical oncologist, um, which basically means I cut out cancers in the head and neck. <laughs> nice to meet everyone. And Dr. Rosenberg? Thanks, Tim. Um, Ari Rosenberg, I'm a medical oncologist, so that means that I use medicines um, to treat uh, head and neck cancer, uh, and also um, running uh, research on using new drugs to improve uh, outcomes for patients with head and neck cancer. I want to remind our viewers too that we are social distancing to as, as much as possible so we have our, our physicians kind of scattered around in here. Usually we'd have everybody at the desk but can't do that uh, just yet. One of these days soon hopefully we'll be back to, to normal. Let's start off with the basics and, and, and Dr. Agrawal we're going to start with you and just have a, you talk to us a little bit about head and neck cancer. What is it and, and, and what do people need to, to know? Sure, so the most common type of head and neck cancer is this thing called squamous cell carcinoma, or SCC, and it basically arises from the lining inside our mouth, our throat, and our voice box. Um, a lot of times um, the patients are asymptomatic um, or they present if, with a lump in their neck, but other things to look out for is chronic pain in the head and neck area, um, ear pain that doesn't improve, changes in swallowing and your voice or speech or breathing um, and unintentional weight loss. So Dr. Rosenberg, I, I would imagine a lot of the symptoms that uh, Dr. Agarwal just talked about would probably fool people because they would think, oh, I've just got a sore throat, maybe allergies or a cold or something like that. Does that make it difficult to, to diagnose these types of cancers? Yeah, I would say yes. Um, oftentimes, um, you know, we see patients uh, who present to our clinic um, after they've received, you know, a course of, of treatment for an infection or something like that. Um, but like Dr. Agrawal mentioned, I think it is important, uh, you know, if you have those symptoms, uh, to get it checked out um, and to uh, diagnose it if it's present. So what are some of the biggest risk factors of, of head and neck cancer? I would imagine probably the, the one that, that I would think of right off the bat would be smoking, but there are other risk factors as sure, well. Sure, Tim. So just back to the previous point. Sure. Um, so the other thing, so the chronicity of the symptoms makes a major difference. So if anything lasts greater than two weeks, have a fairly low threshold to see your doctor to, for further evaluation. There have been a lot of high profile head and neck cancers um, in, in, in the news that were, had a delayed diagnosis, just as you mentioned, because it's a very non-specific complaint. In terms of the risk factors of head and neck cancer, the major risk factor is smoking. Um, other um, risk factors include alcohol, heavy alcohol use, and HPV or the human papillomavirus. Um, those are the three major risk factors for head and neck cancer. What about uh, the smokeless tobacco? That sure. Some folks so use? yeah, so sort of under um, the tobacco, um, the smokeless tobacco, chewing tobacco is an other, another major risk factor. Um, more so in other parts of the world, including Asia, less so in really? the United States. Just the incidence of oral tobacco product use is much less in the United States versus um, the rest of the world, um, but more common is tobacco smoking in the United States. That makes sense. You know, it's interesting, and, and I think a lot of times when, whenever we do a program and we, we talk about cancer, people immediately get that, that, that fear and that feeling that, you know, if they're diagnosed that it's, 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 it's a death sentence, and that's not the case. We want to stress that. And, 
I, I want to play a video, and John, we'll, we'll, we'll play the video here in just a moment, but this kind of, I think, demonstrates um, some of the work that can be done to help people. And again, to your point, Dr. Agarwal, just you've always got to be aware of your body. So let's go ahead and roll that video, and then we'll talk about that afterwards, John. No, she's going to go, we're, we're, we're going to square up right underneath. It becomes super symmetrical at that point. About six years ago, I was diagnosed with stage four neck and throat cancer. So it was a shock to me. Of course, it was a, a huge, huge shock. You know, um, you know, you're just into your 50s. You still feel a bit indestructible. You know, you're not thinking that uh, you know cancer is going to be part of your life. Come over here for a second. Yeah. Look, look right here. My hand. Well, but you can get behind me. No, it was very scary, um, very difficult for me. We went up to our cabin in Michigan, and he actually, you know, made dinner and everything, and just try, and we started talking about it, just a lot of different things. And all of a sudden, I noticed how emotional he was, and and I said, "What's going on?" You know, and that was when he actually told me what he had discovered, and it was, you know heart-wrenching, you know, I'm just so upset. The answer that we got was, you don't have to travel far. You've got the very, very, very best in your backyard. They said the University of Chicago's got this amazing program, and there's a, a doctor there by the name of Dr. Everett Volks, who is breaking ground, who is the number one in his field, and he is your guy. For all we can tell, it had a good outcome uh, because uh, we were able to minimize surgery and uh, he is here doing important work for us here at the University of Chicago. Oh wow, you know, honestly I really love the team there very, very much. I remember that the nurse, the main nurse at the time, Denise, uh, she was absolutely wonderful. Just any questions that we had, they would answer immediately. I got a call from an advertising agency out of New York. Uh, they had a hospital who they couldn't speak about yet because the client didn't, because we hadn't had the job yet. Um, but they wanted me to do a, a campaign for them um, that would help bring recognition to this hospital. Well, little known to them, um, I had just left this hospital. I had just been cured of stage four cancer from this hospital. And once they found that out, just the serendipity, the coincidences just became a natural. That's, uh, 60 frames per second. Yes, sir. Let's burn some film. What we really wanted to show is that the University of Chicago, first and foremost, has probably some of the best doctors in the world. They are getting the best of the best. And that's what we wanted to show in these spots, that you are dealing with the it, most innovative technology possible to me and, and you're going to come out the other end and you're going to get right back to your life and you're going to enjoy your life. Try to enjoy life um, to the fullest. I mean if we could travel somewhere just for a day, if we could take a road trip somewhere, we do it. You know, and, it, and we do it together. You learn to make every minute count. Uh, every bit of time with your wife, your children, your grandchildren become more important. I knew at this point that it was time for me to really take the challenge and, and, and push everything to the limit and do the absolute best work I could do. So the story behind the story, he's actually done two campaigns for us now. And a great guy, it was a lot of fun to meet. His wife is a wonderful, wonderful person as well. And, and a lot of fun to work with on, on both of those campaigns. And, and, and it just seemed, the story behind it was just awesome that he had actually been here. So I think you know, that made it even, the connection even that much better. So, but again, it shows that there is, you know, there's hope out there. And Absolutely. a great team. Definitely. So, Let's talk about some of the uh, the risk factors, and 
Uh, we, we touched on that just a moment ago, but Dr. Rosenberg, from your standpoint with the, the work you do, what do you see when patients come in? What is HPV, uh, I know we've talked about that and we've talked about that in the past, how, where does that rank on the risk factors and, and how important is it for, for folks to get their, their children uh, inoculated? Sure, no, absolutely, Tim. Um, so, you know, a number of throat cancers can be associated with HPV, human papillomavirus. Uh, and we're actually seeing more and more of that. So an increasing incidence, more and more patients are being diagnosed with uh, HPV-associated throat cancer. Uh, fortunately, um, there is an HPV vaccine uh, for uh, children and teens um, that, is, that is approved um, and being administered in primary care doctors that um, essentially prevents um, patient, people from um, developing HPV-associated cancer. So it's highly effective and uh, strongly recommended. And I think they've actually they've kind of changed the guidelines a little bit on that in recent years as far as ages too. I don't know if uh, you can talk a little yeah, bit about so that. So that's changed and um, initially it was teenage um, boys <laughs> and girls um, and then went into the 20s and now actually less than 45. Um, and my wife and I, um, I'm still less than 45, got the HPV vaccine. Um, it has been proven to be very effective. Um, in preventing HPV-associated cancers, both in the head, neck, and other areas. Um, so we really are, are strong uh, proponents of it. So that's news to me right there, and which is, is, is interesting. I hadn't realized that it, they'd increased it that much. So that's so good what, news you can yeah, use. Yeah, so the reason, Tim, is people's social situations change, mm -hmm. um, and most people are exposed to HPV fairly early in life, but not everyone. Um, so it's really to accommodate sort of that changing landscape um, in, pe pe uh, in people's personal social lives. Oh, great, that's, that's really good to know. So let's talk about some of the treatments for head and neck cancer. We, we have both of you on and you, you do very different things when it comes to that. And Dr. Rosenberg, I'm going to start with you. Um, tell us how, how you treat and some of, the, some of the basic treatments from your standpoint. Sure, no, absolutely, Tim. Um, so, you know, whenever a, a new patient uh, comes to, to the clinic, uh, the first thing we um, characterize is uh, the, the diagnosis. We confirm the diagnosis, and we do that oftentimes with a biopsy and work closely with Dr. Agarwal and our other surgical colleagues to make sure, and our pathology colleagues, to make sure that we have the right diagnosis. And then the next thing we do is we uh, stage the cancer. We find out um, where it's spread to. Um, is it very small and localized to one spot, or has it spread to uh, lymph nodes in the neck, for example, um, or other parts of the body. And a lot of that information is very important in determining uh, what the right treatment approach is. And then after that, um, it's actually very important that uh, patients meet a number of different doctors that um, treat head and neck cancer. So um, I'm one of those doctors, a medical oncologist that uses medicines, like I mentioned, to, to treat head and neck cancer. Um, but all patients you know, will ultimately meet uh, a surgeon, a head and neck surgeon like Dr. Agarwal, um, as well as a radiation oncologist, uh, a, a doctor that uses radiation. And these are the three tools that we use to treat um, head and neck cancer. And it's very important with a new diagnosis that we all take a look at the case, discuss it as a group, and figure out what the right personalized approaches for an individual patient, whether it's a patient that would benefit from uh, uh, surgery first, um, followed by other types of treatment if, if needed, or whether uh, a patient benefits from uh, a non-surgical approach first by combining chemotherapy or radiation, for example, um, and sometimes even uh, new medicines to, to treat cancer as well. So uh, it really depends on the situation, and we discuss it uh, to figure out what the right uh, approach is for, for a given patient. So, Dr. Agarwal, I think you know this. What Dr. Rosenberg was just talking about is so important. It's it's this team effort that we see, and it's kind of that one, two, three punch even uh, for for treatment, um, and and it's just so important. And and that it really is. You you all you all get together. You discuss uh, different patients, and it's it's a big process, but it's an important process. I think it's the most important process. Um, so. What makes us fairly unique um, in head and neck oncology across the world is um, really the fact that it's become a multidisciplinary discipline um, where there's engagement with medical oncology, radiation oncology, and surgical oncology. Um, and we really keep our egos aside and we all meet, discuss the patient at a multidisciplinary tumor board, um, and 
and optimize what's best for the patient. And um, multiple studies have shown that a multidisciplinary approach um, to the treatment and management of head and neck cancer makes a dramatic difference in both outcome and function. Um, and beyond medical oncology, radiation oncology, and surgical oncology, there are other med medical um, teams that are involved in the care, including speech language pathologists, um, dietitian, physical therapists, occupational therapists. So it's a it's a big team: pathologists, radiologists. And um, again, we all come together really to find the best option for the patients. And it makes such a huge difference, and I, I just think that is, is, is so critical. So I'm, I'm glad both of you uh, talked about this. We do have some, some viewer questions and comments coming in, so I do want to remind our viewers, just type them in the comment section, and we'll, we'll get to those. Here's a nice one. Uh, uh, Beth says, Dr. Stenson removed her cancer. Uh, she's been cancer-free for seven years. Thank you, University of Chicago. So that's very nice. Um, have a few others coming in. Um, how do we know when a lump or a bump in your neck is more serious? Um, and I think, you know, as we all age, because I've got these as well, you get lumps and bumps in places where you didn't have lumps and bumps before, unfortunately. And and it, it's, it's difficult to know, you know, do I need to go see my physician or is this just part of life? Yeah, absolutely, Tim. So lumps and bumps all over our body are very common. Um, generally more often happen in younger patients and it's inflammatory or reactive. Um, but as we get older, those lumps and bumps shouldn't happen as frequently. So again, if something um, comes and goes or resolves after a couple of weeks, um, it's probably innocuous thing. But if something persists, grows or spreads, two to four weeks or longer, then it's something that requires additional attention. Um, and the next steps are generally a combination of an examination, some sort of imaging, and usually a needle biopsy. And it, it never hurts just to go see your physician if you have a question. It's better safe than sorry. It doesn't take that much time, and, and, and you'll, you'll sleep better, obviously, that evening if you uh, find out some, some good news. Absolutely, Tim. So one thing we haven't discussed is the survival for head and neck cancer is very dependent on stage. Okay. So if we can identify early stage cancer, stage one and two, the survival is much superior to, uh, to compared to advanced stage three and four cancers. So early diagnosis is key um, in both outcomes and decreasing the morbidity um, some of the side effects, both from the treatment and the tumor itself. Great. So, Dr. Rosenberg, can you talk to us a little bit about immunotherapy? Actually, I'll throw this open to, you, to each of you. You can you can both answer this one. But it, it's immunotherapy is something we, we hear more and more about when it comes to cancer treatment, and it's a it's a fascinating area. I don't know if you can address that. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, immunotherapy. There's a number of different types of immunotherapy, but um, the mo one that's most commonly talked about in a number of cancers, in particular head and neck cancer, um, are actually medicines that are immunotherapy. These are medicines that um, don't kill cancer cells directly, like chemotherapy or radiation do, um, but rather medicines that um, release the breaks, if you will, on the immune system, the immune cells, your own body's immune system, so that your immune system can then go and attack cancer. And immune therapy has um, improved survival in a number of different cancer types. And one of those cancer types is indeed head and neck cancer. Uh, and we use it very commonly um, in the more advanced uh, situation where um, you know, when head and neck cancer spreads to other parts of the body. Uh, because we know in that type of situation that either by itself or with other types of treatments um, that they help patients live longer. Um, Actually, at the University of Chicago, because it's worked so well in more advanced disease, we've actually brought it um, as part of some of our clinical trial research and some of our um, uh, ongoing uh, treatment protocols uh, into the earlier stage. Um, and so that, that's something that we're currently uh, investigating to see if that's something that can also help patients with earlier stage cancer do better. That's fantastic. And we'll talk more about uh, uh, some of our, our uh our clinical trials because that to me again that's that's an area where I think you Chicago does a, a wonderful job and it's a very important part of the work that that happens here do we have a, a statement slash question from a viewer and and this is this is important wanting to know if nurses are part of that multiple multidisciplinary team um, they were not mentioned 
obviously they are nurses oh, are absolutely so that's, that's my oversight so the centerpiece is patients and their families um, but the next foundation are, are all our amazing nurses um, they are integral in every aspect of care of um, patients um, including cancer patients so absolutely we do have a great nursing team here it's it's uh, it's fun to see them work and and talk to them and 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 they do fabulous work here as well so it, it is all it truly and I, I can't overstate this enough I've, I've heard this many times from from patients the entire team here is what really makes this a special place and and it's they do wonderful work you all do wonderful work and um, I'll, I'll just go ahead. add to that yeah, yeah just real quick here Tim before we move on sure um, it, it's not you know obviously the nurses are an integral part of the team but they're also nurses that have um, a lot of experience and specialization in head and neck cancer specifically. Yeah. Um, so it, it's also their, their expertise within the integrated program that uh, you know, allows it to be an important component as well of the multidisciplinary team that uh, both you, Tim, and Dr. Agarwal mentioned. No, that's great. I, I'm glad, glad you all both said that because I, I think those are, are fantastic points. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about clinical trials if we can for a moment. And I don't know who wants to take this, but uh, again, this is work that's done here at UChicago Medicine. That uh, Dr. Rosenberg, let's let's start with you because I, I think it's so important, and it it really affords uh, patients the chance to be on the the leading edge of of treatment, and it's it's pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Tim. Um, certainly, our clinical trials are an important part of the program. Um, you know, we try very much to you know not only cure patients and help patients live you know, long, but also reduce the side effects of treatment. And so we have um, clinical trials across different situations for HPV-associated throat cancers, for non-HPV, um, patients with earlier stage disease, patients with more advanced disease, all in trying to uh, improve patient outcomes. Um, one, one of the important situations that we, that we see is new medicines, new drugs that are being investigated um, for, uh, you know, to, to treat head and neck cancer. Um, you know, in particular to making our um, treatments work better uh, in combination or, or by themselves in, in various settings. Um, we also do a lot of research to identify new tests that we can use to um, help patients receive the right personalized kinds of treatment. Uh, we do this kinds of testing on, um, on, on blood, for example, or, or tumor tissue and things like that. Um, and we do it all collaboratively, you know, within the group as well. <coughs> All right, so Susan has a, uh, a question for us, and she wants to know, is there any research to support uh, why, with no apparent risk or family history, young females with non-HPV oral cancer is growing? Is that, is that a number that's growing? Uh, significantly, yeah. There have been a few studies that have shown increasing incidence of oral cavity, so in the mouth, um, cancers that are not associated with uh, smoking, um, heavy alcohol use, or HPV. Um, it's really a mystery in our field. Um, we have not been able to identify um, a carcinogenic source for that patient population. Um, there's some debate whether it's uh, more common in women versus men, um, but we see it in both uh, men and women. Um, and we see it in um, younger patients, sometimes um, in their late 20s, early 30s, um, and spanning through the 80s to 90s. Um, so patients who have no significant uh, history of tobacco use. Um, our group and other groups are actively investigating this, um, but this is something we have to figure out. Interesting. Yeah, it sounds like uh, uh, an area that uh, a lot of work is being done, I'm, I'm sure, and needs to be done. We are, we are having a lot of comments uh, supporting various physicians and nurses at U Chicago Medicine. I'd love to read them all off, but we may be here for a while if we do. So suffice it to say, you all have fans, uh, <laughs> which, is, which is nice. Um, let's talk about, I, I'm kind of curious as far as from your standpoint, the various types of treatment. Um, do we use robotic surgery at all in, in any of these, uh, these treatments? Yeah, sure. So as Dr. Rosenberg said, the mainstay of cancer treatment um, for most type of cancers is chemotherapy, and under that there's things like immunotherapy and targeted therapy, radiation therapy, and surgery. Um, within surgery, um, we're technology driven, um, so we really um, are integrating robotic surgery um, into head and neck cancer management, um, and that really allows um, a resection of inaccessible tumors 15 years ago, but now we can access them through an open mouth. 
Um, so it's really um, been very transformative in our field. Um, and the robots continue to get better with each generation. Um, so it's, it's a very exciting area. Um, right now, robotic surgery is mo mainly used for HPV-associated um, tumors in the tonsil or the back of the tongue, um, and occasionally for uh, tumors of the voice box. Um, but their indications continue to grow um, um, f um, over the next few years, and it's a very, very exciting area for um, head neck cancer management. The, the technology that you search and use is just unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, eventually you want to push a button and it'll cut the tumor <laughs> out. Yeah. We'll be there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty impressive stuff. And, you know, the, the robotic surgery, as you were talking about that, you, you, I, I've been lucky enough to actually get to look in through the, through the little eyepiece during a surgery. And, and it's amazing what you can see in the, in the three-dimension aspect of it yeah, is, is fantastic. Absolutely. The optics are better than our eyes. Yeah. Um, and we work on um, millimeters, so the thickness of it and the single hair. Um, but the visualization, the magnification, the angles um, are what we're able to obtain with robotic surgery is really, um, it's a breakthrough. Um, and it's exciting because the technology is going to continue to get better. So more questions uh, from viewers, so let's, let's get to those. Amanda asks, if, if the two of you can talk about support for patients post-treatment in terms of survivorship, and I know we, we do a lot in that area. We've got, uh, you even mentioned some of the, some of the work we, we do with patients from, uh, even from dietitians and, and on, but I know it, it's so much broader than that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, survivorship is very important for head and neck cancer, of course. After completing treatment and um, when patients are, um, um, have no evidence of cancer, uh, of course we want their quality of life to be um, a as good as it can be. Um, and so that, that's sort of what we think about with, with survivorship. Um, we involve a number of different team members um, depending on the specific situation, but, and Dr. Agarwal mentioned them a little bit early as well during treatment, but also after treatment. Uh, dietitians to help with nutrition, uh, speech and swallowing specialists to focus on um, speech and swallowing and function uh, afterwards, uh, psychosocial support um, afterwards uh, in terms of psychosocial issues related to um, being a cancer survivor, um, and including social work, um, and of course physical therapy, occupational therapy, all these folks are involved in, um, in, in follow-up afterwards. Um, and then I'll, I'll just mention also, because it's very important, is that you know, when patients are undergoing active cancer treatment, they're seeing us a lot, right? They're, we're seeing them frequently. For those getting um, medicines to treat cancer, we're getting blood tests, we're seeing them, we're you know, very active in their treatment. And as patients get farther and farther out from completing their treatment without any evidence of cancer that, that we can um, see, then um, they start seeing us less frequently, which is a great thing. And a lot of times we work with primary care doctors and other types of um, healthcare providers in order to make sure that um, the optimal support and all the preventative treatments that are so, so important for all patients, but in particular cancer survivors, are things that are happening for patients. That's great. And, you know, the psychosocial aspect of it, which you, you, you mentioned and you talked about pretty extensively, is I think that's so critical because, again, it, it, it's life-changing. This is a huge, huge um, Thing that's happening in your life and it, it does have a pretty significant impact and I, we have some wonderful support groups that work with people for potentially years on out. Yeah absolutely so survivorship is critical um, so once patients um, and their family members are done with the acute treatment survivorship really kicks in and again it's a multidisciplinary approach with nurses, um, physicians and, and the, as Dr. Rosenberg mentioned, speech and swallow therapists um, and other medical staff. Um, there's also um, a lot of support system that's around and organizations, both medical organizations and um, patient center organizations um, such as Head and Neck Cancer Alliance, Oral Cancer Foundation. Um, so there are a lot of resources out there. You know, a few decades ago, this was probably underappreciated, but now um, survivorship really draws a lot of attention. There's a fair amount of resources dedicated to it at individual institutions and also centrally um, across the nation. We're just about out of time, but I've got a couple more questions I'd like to get to quickly if we can. Carol wants to know how you can check for HPV. What, either one of you want to take that one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, for um, cervical cancer, um, there are screening that um, 
women do um, in order to monitor for uh, cervical cancer, and that's worked quite well. For uh, throat cancer related to HPV, we're not quite there yet. We hope to be, and there's a number of um, evaluations trying to um, see how we can best um, screen or check for, for uh, HPV-associated cancer in the throat. Um, but as of now, we're, we're, we're not quite there. Um, so hopefully we will be uh, at some point. Uh, for now, um, you know, I think the, the main thing is uh, keeping an eye out for uh, some of those symptoms um, that Dr. Agarwal had mentioned a little bit earlier um, that should certainly bring you to see your doctor and, and get checked out. All right. Technically, we are out of time. I do have to read one more, though, because I think this is really nice. So this is from Jamie. And Jamie says, Dr. Agarwal and the entire Head and Neck team are phenomenal physicians. The level of care provided is above and beyond. They truly t treat patients like family, and that makes going through this difficult time much easier. So I, I just, to me, that's so nice to, to hear that kind of thing. So kudos to the two of you. Uh, wonderful work. And, and uh, we are out of time. I, I apologize. We can get, get to more questions, but this went pretty quickly. You guys thank did you a great Tim. job. Thank you, Tim. Great. So thank you for to our physicians, obviously, for being with us today. And a big thank you to those of you who watched and participated in the program. Please remember to check out our Facebook page for our schedule of programs that are coming up in the future. To make an appointment, go online at uchicagomedicine.org, or you can call 888-824-0200. Thanks again for being with us today, and I hope everyone has a great weekend.